Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my session, Optimized Reliability of Steam-Driven Turbines. Uh, I'm going to turn my webcam off now, but I just wanted to say hello and thank you for attending this session. And first of all, a small disclaimer. Today, I'm only providing tips. I'm not giving specific advice. If you have questions, please contact me later. Let's talk about turbines, and you may wonder why turbines with the distillation conference? Well, we're going to talk about single stage turbines and multi stage turbines or turbines. And even single stage turbines can be rather sophisticated. We want to extract heat energy and convert it to motion by expansion. Why is this important to distillation? Because it's used in so many distillation operations, and your distillation assets will not perform if their turbines are not running properly. Most of the turbines we deal with are single stage design, and that's typically medium or high pressure steam supply, including superheated steam temperature. But sometimes we've got wet steam, and even the superheated steam may have moisture in it that we have to deal with. Exhaust pressure can vary from a reduced pressure even to atmosphere or vacuum. Condensate drainage is normally light to no load, but the exceptions are when we have carryover slugs, if we have to worry about the exhaust load or very wet steam. And I'm going to explain that throughout the presentation. It's a wide range of power output, but 80% of the turbines are relatively small, between 100 and 1,000 horsepower. Okay, so this is a typical recommended term, turbine installation. It's used for these applications, pumps, compressors, forced air, draft, and blowers and rotating machinery. Condensing turbines. Let's take a look. The exhaust goes directly into a surface condenser. The condenser pulls a strong vacuum when the condenser is working properly. We're going to explain that later. Often multi-stage and the pressure range varies. So here we have a condensing turbine application. We see it's rather sophisticated, going to use it for things like wet gas compressors, main air blowers, can pull 28, 29 inches in vacuum. And the goal is to maximize the horsepower and efficiency and to optimize the production of that unit. Now, I almost said to talk about this, but let's talk about the economics. If we focus just on distillation and not the equipment that's part of the distillation, such as turbines, these are some of the issues that occur. And we're gonna talk about how to mitigate those using API recommended practices 580 and 581. So we can take a look at the probability of failure event, and we can take a look at the consequence of a failure event in terms of dollars. And our risk is a probability times the consequence. So we might have an acceptance threshold, something like this. And here you see I've just put in two assets. One is in green, one is in orange. So we could reduce the risk by lowering that probability of failure. We cannot change the consequence because you have to change the process to change the consequence. But we can mitigate the risk. And if we can bring the orange down into yellow and the green down into dark green, this is going to be a much lower risk factor. So we're going to focus on these type of problems that are caused by condensate in steam systems. We're going to try to avoid this type of damage, some of which is catastrophic, <clears throat> such as this one where the turbine has lost its top. We're going to try to get turbines out of the graveyard. We're going to try to cut back on things like, you know, precipitation causing imbalance, which reduces the efficiency, erosion, corrosion, water hammer damage, unscheduled downtime. Okay, so this is really what prompted me to talk about this presentation in the Distillation Experts Conclave. There was a refinery that didn't pay a lot of attention to the trap population for about four years even though we kept discussing with them. And then their turbines got knocked out in a single event and it knocked out the FCC and HCC turbines and their units shut down 
and they said it was over 65 million, but we estimate probably closer to between 100 and 160 million dollars of loss. So this is the purpose of this presentation to give you some of the feedback how to avoid these type of events. So typical scenes and site mitigation efforts and why. Take a look at your turbine area. Does it look like this? A lot of slow rolling going on. This is decreased energy efficiency and does not necessarily protect the turbine. How about this? Let's start with a steam heat asset that is used not only for production, but also to drive equipment such as turbines. We're going to distribute it, use it, return it, and generate it, but we want to pay attention to dry steam and once we use that heat energy, drain it fast and recover the condensate. But let's take a look at this dry steam idea. Do you have superheated steam, saturated steam, and wet steam in your plants? You're going to probably say yes. Yeah. So if I say to you, what's your saturated steam pressures? You'll say, oh, it's, you know, 10 bar, it's 150 PSI, something like that. But Sat saturated steam doesn't exist in your plant. All steam in your plant is either superheated or wet. There is no saturated steam. That is what I call the dry steam fallacy. If you want to read more about that, this is an article I did in chemical engineering two years ago. It's on the TLB.com website, steam quality considerations. It's also on chemical engineering's website. So this is more appropriately describing what steam looks like. You've got condensate flowing along the bottom of the pipe, and you've got water entrained in the steam. Now, when you've got superheated steam, you probably won't have any water entrained in the steam because the steam is at superheated temperatures, but you still can have water disentrained and flowing along the bottom. I'll explain that later. Steam velocity typically is 100, and 100 miles an hour, 162 kilometers per hour or more. And if you build up the, the water into a slug in the cross-sectional area, that velocity can be over 200 miles an hour. So water hammer is going to equate to turbine damage. And that can equate to an unscheduled production shutdown. Lots of turbines can be damaged, not only the main compressors, but you can have things like lube oil pumps damaged. Okay. This is another fallacy that superheated steam is safe from hammer. So I'd like you to pay attention to this. You see this plant, take a close look at it and see if you notice this line. It's a little bit out of kilter. The reason for that is because they had a 400 foot length of 24 inch pipe in a 220 PSI G superheat line move seven feet by a slug of over 3,000 pounds by their estimate. That moved, that force was so high, it moved 250,000 pounds of pipe and overcame the supports and anchors. So they thought it was superheated and it didn't have any condensate, but when we opened up the various drains valves, it drained condensate for three days. And what I'd like people to consider is that when you've got superheated steam, the the high temperature steam is moving over the water and if the water doesn't have a drain point it's kind of like the sun trying to evaporate all the water in a lake it's not going to get it all it's not a boiler it's high temperature steam moving over water flow so we've got to protect all steam lines including superheated steam lines now how does the steam trap population correlate to risk well here's a data from 2002 to 2013 Almost annual, they skipped in 2004 and 2012. But look at the good trap population. They let it get down to 38% of the trap population. And if you notice that last line, there's a lot of blue. That means a lot of cold traps, which are not doing any drainage at all. What do you think is going to happen to a plant like that with an insufficient amount of good traps? Well, I'll tell you, this is the results that they had. And almost all of that relates to distillation. Let's take a look at another site from 97 to 2011. 
look what they did to both their good traps and look at the small amount of cold traps, 78% good with a very small amount of blocked traps. The results, yes, they had very few reliability issues. This is in one of my articles. And here's another one, Steam Trap Management, do something, anything, please. Please read this to get additional information. By the way, Steam Trap Management doesn't have to be a nuisance. I hope you see this bullet coming up. The internal rate of return can be greater than 112%. So it not only is great for the reliability of a plant to mitigate risk and to maintain high uh, optimized operations, but it also is very economical. The best practice piping uh, for steam supply lines. Let's take a look at it. We've got to get condensate to drain into a large opening in the collecting leg so it can drain down. And it can be diverted to a trap. Now, sometimes the takeoff is too close to the header. Look how short this takeoff is to the header. That's not enough volume for a trap. This particular trap shown is a cyclical trap, and that's not enough volume to keep all the water out of the header. When we encounter something like that, we've got to try to overcome it by creating a false collecting leg, something like this. It's not the ideal, but we can do it using the mud leg and making an extended mud leg or coming off to the side with a dog leg. Neither one of those is good. This is what happens when we have poor drainage off of a main feeding turbines. So take a look at, at this line. This was knocking out 400 PSIG turbines. And look at how the meta header moved and bent the pipe. Crazy, right? So here's why. Here they have the trap. And here they have multiple trap replacements to tell everybody, hey, we keep replacing this trap. And it's not getting any better. Well, the problem with this was that originally there was a disc trap here. And by putting in a bottom in top out bucket trap, the water level may have to reach to this height inside the piping before the trap can fully drain it. So that, that line never really gets fully drained. We're gonna mitigate these type of events on new designs with effective collecting leg design. We not only wanna pay attention to the diameter, but also the distance for the takeoff, the D2, sorry, the L distance. And you see that into this chart. This is courtesy of ASHRAE. So where do we put what we call condensate discharge locations? This is not only the steam trap, but all the piping included with the steam trap. That's a condensate discharge location. It's a location where we need to drain or discharge condensate. So these are basic rules. Every 100 to 150 feet, you know, 33 meters, uh, bottom of risers and drops before and after control valves. I want to repeat that before and after control valves and at the end of headers. So this is what it should look like. Something like that for the placement. We went to another refinery that was having a significant issue in their FCC unit. Their standards called for CDL placement every 100 feet or 33 meters. And yet we went 1,300 feet when we did the assessment before the first working trap. Actually, there was only one working trap in 2,400 feet, if you can imagine that, a 750 meters or so. All right, uh, so let's take a look at leak repair collars. Whenever we've got this, there's usually a cause. The cause is not steam, it's water slugs, typically. And that's hammer from condensate pooling, and you might have collapse hammer. If you don't know the causes of hammer, I did two webinars on water hammer. You can find them on the TLV website, one for water hammer and steam systems, one for hammer and condensate systems. This type of elbow in a leak repair can cause FCC issues by having steam blow out the pipe. Let's take a look at what happens in a steam line. This is a vertical expansion loop. Basically not a great idea if you don't have proper uh, trapping. So here the condensate builds up. It can't jump up overhead. It's gonna build up higher, still can't jump up overhead. 
until you, you block it off and now you have a slug, almost like a torpedo, and that is going to create some hammer. So why do that? Just put in a simple drain leg. It's much cheaper to put in a drain leg than to have to do a leak repair collar. That high velocity slug is going to damage something, not only that elbow, but that slug is gonna keep going downstream. So we would put in a condensate discharge location, something like this. Now, here was another problem with one of the refineries we looked at. <clears throat> the old boiler used to flow in that direction, so they did have a CDL in that location. However, they switched to a new boiler, and they did not bother to put in a CDL here, so you can imagine what happened. Yes, they damaged those elbows. So when you've got flow reversal, whenever you've got flow reversal, make sure that your vertical risers have got traps at the bottom of those risers to discharge the condensate. And that was the cause of this FCC and HCC turbine damage in the United States. We still say worth 100 to $160 million is our estimate. Okay, so what did we do to help the site when we went on to them? Uh, we did multiple things, things like condensate collection bottles. You can read about that in the hydrocarbon processing article that I did. But some of the things is we're going to put a steam separator finally before the turbines and the steam leading into the FCC unit. We don't want to damage that separator by getting slugs. So we've got to take care of the slugs before that with a condensate collection bottle and appropriate drain locations. But still to protect the turbines with additional protection, we put in the separator also. If we've got bi-directional flow, we're going to put CDLs on both sides. Now, take a look at what causes turbine problems. Take a look at these drain points. Do you think these drain points are adequate? They're not. They're insufficient. Condensate's going to pass right over those. They're too small a diameter. Uh, this particular casing drain is plugged on a turbine. And here, the turbine exhaust casing connection is used as a bracing bolt. I can't imagine, right? All right, so let's take a look at steam main reliability requirements. We want to have little condensate backup. We want to achieve continuous discharge, maintain a tight seal against leakage from steam, has to be suitable for superheat applications where appropriate, so please let your trap vendor make the best selection steam traps. So these are TLV models that I'm showing. But even with TLV models, we have alternate selections. And even with TLV models, we make what I consider to be a very powerful bimetallic trap, but we would never use that for steam mains. We use it for different applications. So even though it's a TLV model, we would not recommend it for your steam main drainage. Okay, some more turbine problems, and some of the things we see that people do to save money is confounding sometimes. So here is high pressure side of the turbine leading to a TLV trap. That's great. But this is the low pressure side of the turbine, and it's connected here leading to the same trap. So you've got a low pressure and a high pressure in the same line. So that's going to be a short circuit. Uh, that's not a good idea. And that's actually going to decrease the power of the turbine. Uh, this was a different refinery in the Gulf Coast, and this was a picture that they did taken when the system was shut down uh, just after they had done some repair work to fix, in their opinion, the design that was causing them a lot of problems. When I was there, well, I couldn't really see it because there was a four inch deep condensate pond in an area of 30 by 30, it was all roped off, taped off. So I had to go around from the back of the tank to see it. But when we took a look at the PNIDs of the corrected system, we could see that there were a lot of problems with an improper fix. There was no trap here. The trap that they used on the separator was undersized. They reduced the size from three inch to one, one inch. They had no mud leg, so all the mud was going into the steam trap. It was a long distance to the trap and they had a steam lock. And the trap that they selected was a trap that had a backup. It was cyclical. So this was not a good fix. And here was our recommended fix. They went about 300 feet 
without having a trapping system and they actually pulled steam from the bottom of a superheat line which was a bad idea their thought process was superheat didn't have any condensate well you can see the result of that thought process so rather than installing 300 feet of new eight inch line we made these recommendations to them condensate collection bottle a strainer a separator a mud leg on the collection bottle and then traps were properly sized and selected and when we take a look at the turbine itself if you take a look at your trip and throttle valves you almost never see traps on them but they're supposed to have traps there drain to keep the condensate out of it keep the casing strained and the outlet trap has to be drained too so let's take a look at the best practice we can improve the steam quality going to a turbine so why is that important well, Mark's standard handbook for mechanical engineers says that the efficiency of a turbine stage is reduced 1% for each 1% of moisture present in the steam. So just, you, you can't get the, the condensate to drive the turbine well. So why not remove it beforehand and just put steam onto the turbine so you get the maximum efficiency out of the turbine? So something like this installation, the separator, trapping, and then traps on the upstream side too. There we are. That's what we look at A through G. Different views. So on the separator, this typically can be a larger trap. And if you notice to the right, there's a small trap for the in control valve inlet trap. And then we've got traps on the chest and the exhausting case drain. So you get a backside view of it, and there's the exhaust casing drain trap. Normally, this is a smaller trap, but it can be large depending on the efficiency of the turbine. And then on the vertical riser after the trap for the exhaust trap. Again, the exhaust trap can be a large trap. For turbines, you might want to discharge the condensate to the sewer for visual, uh, a visible indication of the operation and provide drainage after shutdown and depressurization of the turbine. Uh, this is necessary, especially if you don't do manual open. We like to use free flow traps because it can be immediate continuous drainage to avoid backup of condensate into the turbine. And this is a typical size, but on a separator and sometimes for the exhaust side, there will be larger sizes. Look at the free float, even though we're jumping around the condensate load, it's keeping a water seal and it's responding instantaneously. That's why we like to use free float drain traps. For every turbine application, we do a form called a TDA or a turbine drainage application. You fill in as a customer some of the red items in this rectangle. And once we see that the turbine manufacturer the power etc then what we'll do is make model selections for you and that's typically no charge to do that let's take a look at this main air blower and the separator drainage so the site had installed a separator and they thought it was doing a good job for them but look at the temperatures 250 155 101 well that tells us there's a problem and the problem is at the trap. The trap is not draining condensate sufficiently, so the temperature is dropped. That means that there's condensate backing up to the separator, and that is not being as effective as you want to happen with the separator. So when we take a look at the failed separator drainage, there's our current situation, and here's the opportunity to move it downward. And that one particular instance is estimated to be $54,000 of savings. Let's take a look at another one, a flooded strainer and the standby turbine. So here you see the strainer is vertically down instead of on its side, and the temperature gradient is quite significant, and some of that water can pool up into the turbine on a startup application. So there's the current situation. The opportunity to move it down is a significant one. That's $237,000 estimated. This is by a process that TLV calls SSRM, Steam System Risk Mitigation, SSRM. 
So if we take a look at a particular unit and all the different assets, we can decide how to mitigate those. And in this case, a real world example was $1.8 million of savings while improving the optimization of the process unit. If you want to read more about steam system optimization, here's an article on hydrocarbon processing. All of these are available on the TLV site. Here is another one, an inspectioneering journal that explains SSRM. I want to explain a little bit about condensing turbines and casing drainage. So here's the turbine. And if it's condenser mounted, it's really not much of an issue because the condenser is going to work through the electric pump off of the hot well. Very little problems. But if it's pedestal mounted, then that creates more of a significant difference because that turbine casing must be drained. And that is much more challenging. Let's take a look at it. So here's the steam supply. It's a condensing turbine. So that means we're going to be in vacuum. So those traps cannot discharge the atmosphere unless you've got a very high head, like 35 feet of head. So if you don't have 35 feet of head, that's probably not going to happen. So those traps cannot drain. And we're going to get water hammer, impeller damage, and a weakened vacuum. Now here we have a discharge going into the hot well. Okay, so you've got vacuum, but it's the same pressure. And now you've got a three to five foot lift in this case. So that's not going to work either because the condensate would go to the same line all the way across into the almost the middle of the turbine. So that's not going to work either. So you cannot lift at the same pressure. Condensate doesn't flow upward. So those traps can't drain either. And you get that condensate back up. And it's the same problems, impeller damage and weakened vacuum. So here is a solution, and this is to use what's called a power trap for casing drainage. So here we're going to take the discharge, and we're going to connect it to a power trap package that looks like this. And that's going to use a motive steam line that powers the pump, and it's going to put condensate back into the discharge line. If you want to see more about optimizing you know, these type of turbine systems, please watch this webinar, Optimizing Steam Process Heating Applications on TLV's website. I want to talk a little bit about ejectors and condensers, uh, not only on condensing turbines, but also for vacuum systems in general. We'll take a look at it here from a turbine going into a surface condenser. Air must be continuous, continuously removed from the condenser. And that uses an air exhaust system that requires vacuum ejectors. So here we go. There we've got the inner condenser and the after condenser. And you see the ejector in the first stage and the ejector in the second stage. On startup, there can be a hogger jet. But that should only be used on startup because you're venting a lot of steam. Under normal operation, that should be quiet. It shouldn't be like that. But if you see in normal operation the hogger jet running, that means the site has got a vacuum issue with their ejectors. And they've got a weakened vacuum. So let's take a look at ejectors in general. Your motive steam goes in, your suction here. There's your nozzle. And that can have speeds of 3,500 feet per second velocity can be extremely erosive if there's any water in that steam. And if you increase the nozzle area by 7%, Graham says that that uses about 28% more steam and results in reduced suction. So we try to avoid that. That can affect a tower cut point, vapor removal. So this is what we typically do is we'll install a separator and discharge that to a free flow trap to clean up the quality of the steam going to the ejector. And notice below on the drain trap, we want to make sure that that trap is balanced properly to the condensers. Cannot tell you how many times we see poor balance off of a trap. And then that really affects everything with the condenser itself. 
Well, I know that was a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. I hope that it's helpful and I'm now open for questions. Thank you.